Um, yeah, I, I excited about seeing my book in print, um, but I just want to do something more general. Um, I guess I'm used to being in the classroom now, and I'll kind of give you an insight into um, some of the, the fundamental issues and themes that I'm grappling with um, in the book, but I also want to just speak more generally um, about the question of wonder and the wonder of life and how that might fit in the question of religion, which is one of my, my area of, of, of specialty. Um, and actually, my, um, a lot of my graduate training was in the history of Christian um, mysticism. So I want to kind of draw on some themes of not only Christian mysticism, but looking uh, across the spectrum of different religious traditions um, on the question of, of wonder and the question of ultimate reality or, or God or the divine. Um, so let me, um, it's actually kind of fortuitous that someone, I didn't chose the term magical moments. Um, somebody wonderfully <laughs> chose it. It was rather mysterious, but um, it works so well with, with what I want to talk about. Um, and if you don't mind, I'm actually going to start with a video. I do this in a, in a lot of my classes. Um, I, I think my talk is going to kind of focus on the ideas, and so it's going to be devoid of, of a, a lot of visual um, images. So at least let me give you something with, and one of the themes I want to talk about with the experience of wonder is some moment of an epiphany, some disclosure of an insight, some revelatory truth that possibly happens, that happens to all of us. Sometimes we're prepared for it, sometimes it catches us unaware, and sometimes it can actually have a profound life-changing impact on us. And those kinds of moments of clarity or those revelations, those epiphanies, I think are part of the experience of wonder. And I was looking at this um, work by Edward Hirsch, and we're here in the Poetry Center. It's a wonderful book, How to Read a Poem. And he quotes Ezra Pound speaking about Ezra po Pound's uh, moments of epiphanic moments he described as magic moments, moments of metamorphosis, a movement from the ordinary and quotidian into the divine or timeless. So I want to talk about those, those sudden moments that can reveal something um, profoundly important, uh, even, like I said, life-changing, um, and that we can't possibly describe them in that sense of, of certain magical moments that happen in our lives. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in, in popular culture. Um, I've long been interested in, in the history of hip hop. Um, this is a, a video actually from Billy Joel. Um, it's actually, he, he describes a kind of interesting moment in which he actually undergoes, has one of these moments of clarity, these moments, this epiphanies that clearly changes him. He makes some really interesting kind of comments in, in the video. So. I thought, and it's loaded with a lot of um, theological images, um, especially in the, in the Christian tradition, the, the image of baptism here, um, the history of the black church in America. It's kind of a part of the background um, in this song. So I don't know if you've heard it, the song, but it's about uh, this dream that Billy Joel has and how it affected him and that in background noise. Um, but. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, usually we kind of explore some of the, the lines and, and images um, in various videos. But I, I think what's interesting about the, the song is that he's describing, in fact, he explicitly has these autobiographical comments that I, God knows I've never been a spiritual man. Um, but he's describing some, something that happened to him in a dream, some, again, revelation of some sort. He says, I don't know about my life after this. I don't know how it's going to develop after this, but I know I'm not the same person that I was before this experience. And he says he's on this search, searching for something so undefined that it can only be seen by the eyes of the blind. So the metaphor of the night, uh, the dream that happens at night, the search for something that cannot be seen, that cannot be fully um, fathomed by the human mind is certainly a, a strong theme in it. And, and of course, 
uh, the central theme is some moment of epiphany that occurs to him, that happens to him. So I want to talk about some of these issues, um, certain epiphanies, and especially the experience of wonder. Um, you may have heard the starting with Plato and Aristotle, they both described all of philosophy begins with the experience of wonder. The, the beginning of the search for all knowledge, the search for all wisdom, is curiosity, um, fascination, being intrigued by something that the mind cannot fully, when it first encounters it, cannot fully assess it, cannot fully wrap its arms around it. Um, so that's really kind of at the, at the heart of, of all of the search for wisdom, the search for knowledge um, that defines the philosophical uh, project, especially, again, in, in Plato and Aristotle. But I'm also reminded of a famous, to jump to the 20th century, a famous German philosopher, the philosopher Heidegger. Um, he had these, this wonderful, simple line, and none of his work is simple. <laughs> it's incredibly complicated. and He has a classic text called Being in Time. Um, but he has this famous line that is provocative, I think. He says, why is there something in the universe and not nothing? To ponder that thought alone is, I think, can it has the power to evoke in us wonder. I think in, in many real ways that um, almost all the great poets and the best philosophers have, in a sense, tried to provoke in us an experience of wonder, of awe, of amazement, of astonishment that we easily lose as when we grow and become adults, when we mature. So in a sense, all of the poetic project, the poetic enterprise, is about recapturing our capacity for wonder that we once had as children. Um, if you think about Walt Whitman's his famous Leaves of Grass, and it's present in so many great poets, but it's, he, he, in, in Leaves of Grass, he has a child come up to him with grass in his hand. He says the child fetches the grass in his hands, feeling the coolness of it, wondering what it is. And he asks me, what is the grass? And he says, I could not tell him any more than he already knew by feeling it. It's a sense that that child had the ability to wonder at something as simple as the grass, as the trees, as the rivers, the insects, the animals. And that when we become adults, our habits, our routines replace our capacity for awe. Our stresses, our responsibilities, our cynicism replaces our ability to feel the strangeness and mystery of everything around us. Um, in a sense that all of these things, the predictable, our predictable patterns of our lives replaces the surprising and the startling. Um, and all of great poetry, like all of great philosophy, all of great art is about, again, trying to reinvigorate us, to in fact exhilarate us, to again recover that sense of of wonder and awe. So in a sense, uh, what is this experience of wonder? Let me talk about the experience of, of wonder itself. If you think about the experience of wonder, there's something fundamentally like unknown about it. In fact, wonder is an encounter with the unknown. It's something that we cannot assess at the moment of the encounter because it strikes us as profoundly unfamiliar. It's something out of the ordinary, and we are startled by it. It provokes wonder in us because we can't place it in our familiar world at that point. It's an experience of newness, of freshness, something original that, again, caught us unawares. Um, and this overwhelming awareness that can happen to us at certain moments in our lives kind of is an interruption, again, of the ordinary and, and the familiar. And ultimately, what it comes down to is that our lives are surrounded by mystery, um, all of our lives. And this does not, I know it makes some, some people uncomfortable when religious scholars talk about mystery, because typically from a scientific perspective, the idea is that 
religious thinkers, they always appeal to mystery too soon, too quick. And science, give us enough time, we'll figure it out. We'll fill in the gaps. There's always, however, some inescapable mystery about our lives in spite of every advance of the world of science. And so I mentioned, like for example, I like this passage, um, uh, this passage from Einstein. Uh, my, my students are always intrigued by it because they, all of us have, I think, certain, certain preconceptions about science. Um, and Einstein says, the most, the fairest thing, the greatest thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion which stands at the cradle of true art and true science. He who is not and cannot wonder any longer, who can no longer feel amazement is as good as dead. A snuffed out candle. It was the experience of mystery, even if mixed with fear, that engendered religion. A knowledge of the existence of something that we cannot penetrate, of the manifestation of the profoundest reason and the most radiant beauty. It is this knowledge and this emotion that constitutes the truly religious attitude. And in this sense, I am a deeply religious man. So it's quite clear that anybody who actually studies science will also concede that scientific, the scientific um, empirical method is still surrounded by mysteries that confound us that perplex us, that are, in fact, conundrums that the mind will never untangle as much as we advance in, in knowledge. And I think Einstein really understood that and kind of described it in that. So ultimately, there is a sense that all of our lives, that everything around us has a certain strangeness and otherness to it. Everything, again, the trees and the lakes and the rivers, everything. Um, in fact, there's a philosopher that made an interesting comment. He, um, he says, he describes this uh, hypothetical event of this person wandering into a forest. And he wanders into this forest and he comes upon a translucent sphere. And he's struck by wonder at it. But the interesting philosophical comment that this philosopher is making, he's like, what the man does not realize, what he overlooks, is that everything, the world around him, the rivers and the lakes, the trees, is just as wondrous and surprising as this translucent sphere. But the ordinary days of our lives have kind of, again, um, made us uh, lose that sense of the, the wonder of it the wonder of it all. So I think really the experience of wonder, part of it is an experience of like Einstein described, an experience of overwhelming beauty, ravishing beauty that can leave us speechless, that can stun us, um, that can in fact change us. Um, it's this the extraordinary breaking in through the ordinary. It can be a mystifying elation, an overwhelming joy. Um, and in that sense, it's not necessarily, and this is probably a disagreement in the religious traditions between like a religious reading of wonder and I would say a more skeptical and a scientific approach to, to wonder, is that I think um, in the religious traditions, the experience of wonder is not only synonymous with ignorance. It's, that's part of it, undoubtedly. It's part of it. The experience of ignorance is part of the experience of, of wonder. But with the religious traditions, wonder is also a particular glimpse, a hint about reality, of some infinite reality uh, that is good and beautiful and that is disclosing this moment in, in our lives. So it is slightly different, I think, in the religious traditions where um, it's not just ignorance, if you see the distinction, it's not just not knowing, but it's also possibly a revelation of a truth, a truth um, about, the, about reality, about the universe, about God, about ultimate reality. And so I think that's 
in the religious traditions, ultimately the greatest source of human wonder is of course the question of God. This is above all the most wondrous concept that humans have possibly invented or else received as a gift, depending on your, your view. Um, and so in, in that regard, um, there's this famous line from the great philosopher, uh, writer, great Latin American writer, Borges, um, that I wanted to, to quote himself. Borges was probably more agnostic um, than, than anything else, but, but absolutely fascinated by religion and spirituality. He wrote a lot. He incorporated mystical elements from the Kabbalah to, to Sufism into his thought. But um, he has this, this great passage about the question of God. And he says, again, writing from his even uh, more agnostic um, perspective, he says, though, I compiled at one time an anthology of fantastic literature. He says, I have to admit that the book is one of the few that a second Noah should save from a second flood. Um, and I denounce the guilty omission of the major and unexpected masters of this genre. Who are the masters of this genre of the fantastic, of magical realism? He says, Parmenides, Plato, John Scotus Ereugena. Um, for somebody that studied the history of Christian theology, Ereugena, it's interesting he mentions him. He's not a very well-known figure, but he was an absolute genius, a, a fascinating mystical theologian um, that has been recovered even by philosophers, interestingly. But um, Albert the Great, the great teacher of Aquinas, um, Spinoza, uh, Leibniz, Francis Bradley. And then he says, in fact, to what do the prodigies the fantastic mysteries of Edgar Allan Poe or, <coughs> Poe or Wells, what do they amount to when confronted by the thought of God? So I, I think it's an interesting line, again, especially coming from a, an agnostic perspective, of that this question of God, if it's anything else, it's a, um, it's a fascinating question. It's a wondrous thought. Um, and I, I think um, in that regard, I wanted to say something about um, this concept of God as provoking wonder in us all, and how this seems to be the case across most religious traditions. I mean, that also is an intriguing question and issue, the fact that you have all of these strange, unexpected kinships among religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianity, Judaism, on this unnameable reality that we easily call God, but the term G-O-D, and, and we think we understand, we know what, what it means, but in most of these religious traditions, is that's when you lose the concept of God, when you think you know what it means, when it ceases to be an object of wonder and becomes an object of knowledge. When it becomes an object of knowledge, that's what possibly leads to religious violence. That's when you think, you know, I have the concept of God. I have the full truth of God. My interpretation of, of God is the absolute and total truth of the universe. Um, when you lose the sense of the wonder of God, that, that is something that you cannot fully grasp, um, is when it enters into the picture, the history of these um, absolute claims in religion and uh, you know, associated with that, the history of religious violence, the, the certainty that we are either the saved or the possessors of the secret revelation, that those outside of my community um, don't have the privilege of, of, of sharing. So you see this strange concept that God is a source of wonder in so many religious traditions. I mean, going back to the figure of Plato in the Greek tradition, Plato talking about the one, he says at one point in a dialogue that the one, that neither, there is no name nor description nor thought of it that is possible. So he talks about the one as being like this nameless entity. Um, in Judaism, you might be more familiar with the Jewish tradition. I mean, it's a central theme in most of Judaism, the idea that there is this 
um, unnameable reality that the Jewish people and then later um, Christians enter into a relationship with, but the, the, the God that is revealed in these scriptural traditions is always hidden and covered by a cloud of darkness. It's covered by a cloud of unknowing. And so the, that kind of idea, in fact, in, if you remember the stories of Exodus of the Jews leaving um, bondage in, in Egypt, that God accompanies them in a cloud of darkness. And there's famous mystical texts in the Middle Ages that are reflecting on the, the cloud of unknowing, the cloud of darkness. Um, and, and then, of course, the famous uh, moment of Moses that you all are familiar with, where Moses has this, in, this strange encounter with God through the burning bush. And, um, you know, he calls, he commissions Moses to set his, deliver his people from their bondage. And Moses asks them a very legitimate question, like, what is your name? And he answers, you know, the famous line, I am who I am. Um, and which is a name, right? But it's also kind of like not a name, saying that God is ultimately nameless. And so in the Jewish tradition, it's called the Tetragrammaton. It's represented by the YHWH, just by the, the four letters. Um, and the suggestion, that the implication is that, that ultimately we need to treat this, this thought as only a glimpse into who and what God is, never a full possession which again, later Jews, Christians, Muslims uh, often fall into that temptation of thinking that this is, gives us total knowledge of God, when it actually only gives us a glimpse, which is like a partial knowledge, um, partial wisdom, never something that's, um, there's a famous line from T.S. Eliot, I'm just thinking, the gift half understood that's what he calls uh, revelation, the gift half understood. Um, and so that's at, at best what it is. So you certainly have that in the Jewish tradition. You have it in the Christian tradition. And since Borges mentioned Ereugena, um, Ereugena was one of the first to name God as nothingness. He was an uh, eighth century or ninth century. I forget if he's eighth or ninth, but um, they call him John the Scot, uh, Ereugena. He was an Irishman. And absolutely a genius. Um, and he was one of the first to, to really uh, push this um, metaphor of apophasis. I don't know if you heard the term. Apophasis literally means like the speech of unsaying, unknowing. So it's not a speech about God. It's, it's a speech about God that is a failure of speech. That's what apophasis is, the failure of speech about God, what we cannot say. And he used the name God as nothingness. And he even used metaphors of the desert. He loved images of the desert to describe God. It makes sense. Like, the desert is blank. It's deserted. It's desolate. Um, and he's saying that in a sense that all of our concepts fall off it, um, evaporate, the way the rain evaporates on the desert floor. I mean, that, that all of our concepts evaporate in, the, in that regard. They slide off. And another quote that I really like in, um, that I quoted in, in my book is the famous passage, uh, a passage from Pessoa, Fernando Pessoa, the great Portuguese writer, who's absolutely wonderful, wonderful writer, if you ever, very poetic, poetic prose. Um, and he talks about that all of our, again, the concept that all of our images and concepts fall off of God, slide off of God. Every sound mind, he says, believes in God. But no sound mind believes in a definite God. There is some being, he says, both real and impossible, who reigns over all things and all persons um, that cannot be defined and whose purposes, if he has any, he says, cannot be fathomed. By calling this being God, we say everything, since the word God, having no precise meaning, he says, affirms him without saying anything. The attributes of an infinite, eternal, omnipotent, all just, and all loving um, that we sometimes attach to God fall off by themselves like all unnecessary adjectives when the noun suffices. 
Um, so for Pessoa, God is that kind of slippery, unfathomable name and reality. So you certainly have this in, in most of the Christian tradition. Um, the great, another great medieval mystical theologian, Eckhart, um, a German um, theologian in the Middle Ages, um, spoke about God as uh, beyond being, God beyond being. Um, it's a fair, famous image. Or even um, somebody who is attributed as having a very certain metaphysics, like Thomas Aquinas, is <coughs> often criticized for his metaphysics, but even Aquinas um, acknowledged that he says, everything that I've written is nothing compared to what God has revealed to me. So ultimately, he says he doesn't know God. Stunning. The greatest, one of the greatest Catholic theologians in history. He says the greatest knowledge we can have of God is that we do not know God. Again, it's, it's a stunning claim if you think about it. Again, all the volumes that he wrote about God seem to imply that he knew what he was talking about. But then he comes at the end, he says, we, we don't. Um, at best, they're metaphors, they're hints, they're adjectives, again, that, that slide off. You have this, and I'm not going to go on too long with uh, the different religious traditions, but you have it in the Hindu tradition, of course, with the famous um, neti that God is, everybody thinks, the, right, rightfully so, that Hinduism is a pluralistic, uh, polytheistic tradition, all of the different gods. Um, but ultimately, even in the Hindu tradition, there's a concept of, of God, of like um, Brahman, beef prior to all the um, manifestations of, of God. And they often use the language of neti, that God is neither this nor that. Um, in Taoism, the famous line, the first line of the Tao Te Ching, the Tao that can be named is not the Tao. A great, great line in the opening text. The Tao that can be named is not the Tao. Um, in Buddhism, you have the same thing with the, the theory of emptiness. And actually, um, every time I mention this text, the Vimala Kirti Sutra, I'm taken back to my undergraduate years here at the U of A because I had a great professor here, um, Robert Jamello. He's now, I think, at Notre Dame. But um, I remember sitting in his class, him talking about the Vimala Kirti Sutra. Um, and I always remembered the, you know, this discussion about the meaning of emptiness. And there's this dialogue between a disciple and this master, and he's asking him, he's so perplexed, and, tell me what emptiness is. Like, I'm tired of all of these, like, tricks and games of elusive ways that the master gets a away from uh, telling us clearly what, what emptiness is. And he, he tells them that all constructions are empty. He's talking about emptiness. All constructions are empty. And then he says, the construct that all constructions are empty is also empty. And he goes on, the construct that the construct of all constructs is empty is empty. It goes on and on. And the point is, again, that in the Buddhist tradition, that there's this constant self-subversion of language, of any propositions that are made are soon taken away. Um, and so you have that also in, in the Buddhist tradition. And yet, it's a sacred reality. It's not, we're not talking about just like they have this notion of this empty universe with no, it's a sacred reality, emptiness. It's just, they don't have, it's not like a person. Christians and Jews look at God in more using personal language. This is more, um, it's not personal, the images and metaphors of, of emptiness. So you have, I think, again, the, the point of, of all of that is that in these different religious traditions, ultimately that God is uh, the ultimate source of our sense of wonder. And again, to, to stick with that theme, and actually I thought I'd, I'd mention, because he describes this beautifully, is his brand new book, um, I don't get any portion of this. I just wanted to promote it. I think he's one of the best writers, Mexican-American writer, Richard Rodriguez. Um, he just wrote a spiritual autobiography, and it's really wonderful. Um, and he's reflecting on the god of the desert and how the images of the desert gave rise to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. But he does it 
in his kind of own personal way of reflecting on the experiences of his life. And again, one of the comments he makes is, is that how easy it is for these desert religions to be tempted into this, because of the monotheistic traditions, to t be tempted into claiming that we have this full, total possession of our idea of God, of this, this concept of God, and that no other concept need apply, like no other concept is valid. That's the temptation, but he rightfully calls it idolatry. It's idolatry because you're reducing God to an object of human knowledge. And God is clearly not in all of the great theological traditions of Christianity and Judaism. God is not a an object of, of knowledge. God is an object of, of wonder. And um, so uh, with that said, I, my book kind of traces the, that's kind of just a background to the experience of, of wonder. But my book is particularly interested in how the metaphor of wonder um, played a role in the encounter of the new world. And that in the new world, a lot of the explorers appealed rather quickly and frequently to the description of wonder. Um, because, and it makes sense, like the philosopher uh, Descartes, Descartes says that um, wonder is the quintessential experience of newness something that is new, it's the quintessential experience of it. And it's, um, I think that's exactly what is um, clear in, if you look at a lot of the language of the explorers in the U new world and the history of, of trying to describe the new world, it's filled with all of these images of a beauty that cannot be fully named or described. And you even have it in some figures that are very, I think, troubled and ambiguous and, in fact, gave rise to a very disturbing tradition um, on this question of wonder. That is, like, the desire to possess and control that otherness, um, that object of wonder, like a figure like Columbus, who thought that the New World was wondrous, but he had hoped to colonize it, basically, to subdue it. Um, which is, but listen to how he speaks about the encounter of the, the newness of the, this, again, as the name suggests, the new world. Um, the fish here are surprisingly unlike any others. There are some shapes, in the, some of the finest, strangest colors in the world. The colors are so marvelous that everyone wondered and took pleasure in the sight. There are flocks of parrots that darken the sun. There is a marvelous variety of large and small birds different from anything that we've seen. The trees are of different kind, each with its own fruit, have marvelous scents. Hispaniola is a wonder. This country, most serene um, highness, is so enchantingly beautiful that it surpasses all others in charm and beauty as much as the light of day surpasses the night. Um, very often I would say to my crew, however hard I tried to give um, everyone a complete account of these lands that my tongue could not convey the whole truth about it nor my hand write it down I was so astonished at the sight of so much beauty that I can find no words to describe it again it, it, he sounds like a, a mystic trying to write about God I'm so s astonished that I cannot my pen cannot I can't pick up my pen to, to write it um, my tongue falters my tongue is dead in my mouth. It's uh, too heavy. Um, and so he really does sound like a mystic. What's troubling about the history of wonder in the New World is that a figure like Columbus used that concept of wonder and the beauty of it as something to justify uh, conquering. Um, that it became, in their case, like an exotic possession to be owned. You know, rather than to recognize the beauty and to maintain its otherness, um, they sought to subdue it and to conquer, to colonize it. In a sense, it's kind of similar to what I was saying about the theologians on the idea of God. It's like when it becomes an object of knowledge, um, you think you possess it, possess God. But ultimately, as a source of wonder, we can't possess God. Um, I think Columbus made that idolatrous mistake 
it became an object that he wanted to possess. As beautiful as he described it, um, he wanted to, to possess. So that's part of the, the history of wonder that, as you all know, leads to a very troubling history of colonization, of violence, uh, the loss of life of countless native peoples. And that history, um, sadly, has kind of endured throughout so much of Latin American history. And I kind of what I'm describing in this book is that um, what happens in the aftermath of so much violence, of so much suffering, um, of acts of atrocities, of catastrophe, is that what happens is the idea of wonder undergoes a metamorphosis and it turns a lot darker. It becomes more like, and it's a very popular co concept in, you find in the romantics and in a lot of contemporary philosophers, it turns into the sublime. And the sublime is not only, it, it is related to the sense of wonder and that the sublime is also something that is um, incomprehensible, unfathomable, but the sublime is tinged with a feeling of dread as well. It's not just a joyful experience, like in beauty can be just ravishing. Um, the sublime is something that can be disturbing and troubling and frightening. And in a sense, the image of wonder undergoes a metamorphosis in, in that context. It turns into something more dread, dreadful. Um, and to, if, you're familiar with the work of, of Melville, that it's a really good describe, description in, in Moby, Moby Dick. Um, he encounters in the vastness, the immense ocean, he's encountering the sublime. Um, it's terrifying. It's something, it's like he feels like he's wrestling with this unknown power in the universe that is causing death and destruction. Um, and it's symbolized by the white whale but he's ultimately wrestling with the problem of evil in the universe. He's wrestling with suffering, um, the agony of this, again, immense force that is indifferent to him. That's the main point, is that the ocean is indifferent to human well-being. And that's where it turns into a, the sublime. Um, and again, it's in a sense that he's wrestling with the problem of evil, which is one of the great conundrums for all religious tradition. Um, and so I, I, I think that's how the, the direction that my, my book takes of exploring um, how it undergoes transformations. But I also tell the story of different figures like um, the great Las Casas, who was this amazing um, Dominican priest. And Dr. Burns is not here today, but he's uh, proud to be part of that legacy. But um, he was a remarkable defender of the, the Indians. And I talk about how his concept of, of wonder undergoes those transformations when he sees so much death around him, so many people, lives being lost. And, and then I, we look at um, the, I look at the figure of Cabeza de Vaca, um, head of a cow, the, the Spanish explorer to this part of the world. What's amazing about him is, again, he was uh, shipwrecked off the coast of Florida and he travels across the United States. His story is just absolutely stunning. There were movies, wasn't there? Isn't there a movie? Check about, yeah, about Cabeza de Vaca. It's just a stunning uh, a story, but he even comes into the territory of Texas um, and then uh, what is now like Sonora. Um, but anyway, so it kind of traces those different figures. And then I even kind of come up to the 20th century of how the metaphors of wonder and exile are present in 20th century literature of magical realism. And ultimately, my, the, the sense of, of, of the book is, is again, I, I think I already alluded to the, the idea that, that, that wonder is something, a precious heritage that needs to be preserved, um, again, to temper all of the temptations of not just religious in fact, if anything, I'm kind of unfairly harsh just on religious traditions because religious traditions aren't the only ones that are tempted to think that they have the absolute knowledge. There are some, you could also have that in any domain, right? I mean, a scientist could think that there is no truth except science. And anyone outside of science is ignorant and lost and clueless, you know. 
um, and that I have the total truth and nobody else possesses the truth. So there are different forms of fundamentalism um, and dogma, um, and it's not just uh, the religious traditions. But the, the sense of wonder kind of is a check on all of those dangerous, um, violent temptations that seem to be present in, in a lot of human history. And my story takes us through like um, the Americas in particular and the history of Latin America and how it was both a liberating concept in some cases and then like in the case of Columbus and later the later continuing colonization and conquest of Latin America it was also uh, a disturbing um, tool used by some to exotic exoticize and conquer uh, native peoples um, so I think I'll just leave you uh, with um, another, one of the things that I, I mean, if I could have done everything in my book, uh, you also have that in North American traditions. My book focuses on Latin American traditions, but I love this beautiful passage at the end of The Great Gatsby, F. Scott Fitzgerald, because he's describing that exact experience of the wonder of the new world, but in this case, from the perspective of a North American um, back east. And he says this, um, it's that last page of The Great Gatsby. And as the moon rose higher, the inessential houses began to melt away until gradually I became aware of the old island here that flowered once for Dutch sailors' eyes, a fresh green breast of the new world, its van vanished trees, the trees that had made way for Gatsby's house had, one pandered, had once pandered in whispers to the last and greatest of all human dreams. For a transitory, enchanted moment, man must have held his breath in the presence of this continent. Compelled into an aesthetic contemplation, he neither understood nor desired face to face for the last time in history with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. It's exactly what I have kind of was trying to describe about the explorers in the, uh, in the 16th century. He perfectly and beautifully catches um, that encounter in the eastern part of the United States. So I think I'll stop with that, if there's any. <laughs>